Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, this is uh, part six and the conclusion uh, on my study of Calvinism. Uh, I hope you watched the first five and now I'm going to go over the five points of Calvinism commonly called TULIP. Uh, TULIP is an acronym, uh, T-U-L-I-P. Uh, it's the T stands for total depravity of man. Uh, the U is the unconditional election. That means there's no condition for man to be saved. God just randomly chooses people. Uh, L is for limited atonement. In other words, uh, God, uh, Jesus only died for uh, certain people, that were, the people that got saved. He didn't die for the whole world. And God doesn't love the whole world. Uh, irresistible grace means that uh, uh, you cannot resist uh, salvation. If God zaps you, or you get saved uh, even if you didn't want to. You can't, it's irresistible. And then P is uh, the perseverance of the saints. That means that uh, if someone's truly saved, uh, then they're going to have good works and a changed life, and uh, they will persevere in the faith and in good works, uh, uh, proving that they're saved. Uh, so you can see that it's a works-based system. Uh, start off with total depravity. Uh, it's true that, that man is depraved, but not totally. Um, we all have a sin nature. Uh, sin comes naturally to us. Uh, you don't have to teach a child how to lie. Uh, uh, you know, a child may be maybe two, three, four years old, and at some point they're going to start lying to you without even being taught. Uh, they're going to automatically want to be hit somebody or crying if they don't get their way. So this is just part of our nature, and uh, yes, we're, we have a sin nature, we are depraved, uh, however, we do uh, have the ability to um, um, believe something, uh, accept something, uh, make a decision. Uh, even Adam and Eve, after the, after the fall, uh, God walked through the garden and uh, they still knew at that point, even though they were fallen, they understood right and wrong. They understood that they had done wrong. And uh, so man still, even though he's depraved, uh, he, he still has a conscience and he still has the ability to have faith or not have faith. Uh, this chair I'm sitting on right now, even if I wasn't a Christian, it requires faith for me, for me to sit on the chair and believe that that chair uh, it is not only able, but I'm, I'm trusting that it will hold me up. Uh, and I made that as a uh, decision that I made consciously. I decided this on the chair. So I do have a uh, free will. I do have the ability to believe or, 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 and receive the gift of salvation or reject it. Um, now, uh, if a man was actually totally depraved and uh, didn't have the ability to do right or wrong, then uh, I guess uh, no one would ever give any money away to like a, to charity. Uh, we wouldn't do anything good like that. Uh, and we'd just do bad things. Like every time you saw a beautiful uh, woman walk by, you just go rape her because you're so totally depraved. You're not able to control yourself and uh, know right and wrong and, and choose to do what's right instead of wrong. So. Uh, it's, it's a fallacy to think that man is totally depraved and totally in a, in, unable to uh, choose to believe. Now, uh, let's look at some scriptures on this. Uh, uh, Mark 8.34 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus is saying, whosoever will come. In other words, if you will, if you choose to, and if and whosoever means any person without exception. Any person without exception who willingly comes after me is what it says. So here we see, Jesus talking about the will of man. Uh, and then we look at Revelation 22, 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And, and let uh, him that hears say, Come. 
and let him that a thirst uh, is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely again we have whosoever and will so you have the, the free will of man to choose and whosoever means any person now let's look at uh, by the way we could each one of these five points of tulip uh, we could probably discuss for an hour on each of the points I'm just going to give you a brief uh, explanation of it and the, the, the problem with with it uh, and, and then make a conclusion next we're looking at uh, the you and tulip unconditional election uh, it the BR Lincoln said that quote I believe in election God voted for me the devil voted against me and now it's up to me to cast the deciding ballot amen <laughs> yes uh, I think that's how it is God does not desire that any should perish. God is voting for me. He, want, he wants me to be saved. He offers me eternal life, along with every person in the world is offered it. Now, he does not advance those people who uh, will choose him and who will reject him, but uh, it is offered to everyone. There's no conditions uh, except believing in Jesus. Uh, now, of course, probably the devil doesn't want me to get saved, so now who's left? Me. I'm the one that gets to make that final decision. Do I want to um, embrace Jesus Christ as my Savior? Do I want to accept the gift of eternal life from him? Uh, he has eternal life wrapped up in a box, real pretty with a bow, and he's reaching out and handing it to me. Now, do I have the ability to accept the gift? Yes. I have free will. I can accept it or I can turn it down. And the the only uh, condition to have eternal life is that I'm willing to accept that gift. And I did. December of 1986, I received the gift of eternal life. And uh, so now let's look at your, the condition. If you see this in John 3.18. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So here we see the condition. He that believeth on him is not condemned. If you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. So believing is required, because if you don't believe, you are condemned. So the one thing that changes, uh, changes you from being condemned to uncondemned is believing. So we see this is the condition. Now, Calvinists have it all backwards and think that... that uh, uh, we don't believe and then get saved. They believe we get saved and then we believe. So if we get saved simply because God zaps us with some kind of mystical power and he, he regenerates us and now we, we're, we quicken our spirits alive and, and, we, uh, uh, and we're, we're born again and we're saved, we're elect, we're chosen. Well, where is there a requirement for faith then? We're already saved. We don't even have to believe because you got saved before you believed. So believing wouldn't even be a requirement with Calvinism. But it is backwards in Calvinism. We first believe in Jesus and then we receive the Holy Spirit and we're quickened. Our spirit is resurrected, uh, brought to life, and, and we are a new creature in, child, in Christ, a, a child of God. Uh, but first we believe and, and, and then we're saved and born again. Now, another verse that supports this condition is John 3.36. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So here clearly we see uh, the difference between someone who has everlasting life and someone who does not have everlasting life. One condition. They believed on the Son of God for it. So, uh, we know that, uh, that he, they call it unconditional election, but uh, to them, the elect are the ones that are saved, so there's this, we literally call this unconditional salvation. We know that there is a condition for salvation, and that is believing, believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, the L in, in Tulip is limited atonement. That, that just means that uh, Jesus didn't die for everybody. He only died for those people who got saved. And, and God doesn't love everybody. He only loves those who get saved. Uh, this is a horrible blasphemy. 
Uh, it's an insult to Jesus uh, and, and our Father God, uh, saying that he didn't die for everyone. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4.10. It says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now, Calvinists really can't wiggle out of this one. I don't think I have any kind of um, integrity left. Here we see that it says that he is the Savior of all men. Now, they try to say that when it says all men um, or the whole world, uh, they, they try to say that that just talks about all types of men, like uh, Japanese people and, and uh, Mexican people, African people, uh, all kinds of men. They, say, they want to make it uh, mean that. But here it says, all men, especially those that believe. So the differentiation here is uh, believing or not believing. So this is saying he's the savior of all men, those who don't believe, but especially of those who do believe. So every person in the world, believers and unbelievers, Jesus Christ is the Savior. Now, the people who don't believe, even though he died for their sins and their sins are forgiven, they never put their faith in him, so they never get regenerated and become uh, pass from mortality into immortality and receive the gift of eternal life. Now, um, let's look at Romans 5.18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of, of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. So here we have uh, the t same term, all men, the same Greek words, all men. And it says that... Uh, Therefore, as by one, the offense of one, judgment came upon all men. That is because of one man, Adam, sinning. All men since Adam have inherited this uh, fallen state, this mortality. Uh, and uh, so we are all under judgment because we've inherited this from this one man. All men. Now that means every person, even the elect. So... People, a Calvinist who wants to think that uh, the elect, uh, e even before eternity, they were already selected uh, to be a, a separate group of people, that this says that they're the same. A Calvinist or a non-Calvinist, an elect or a non-elect, they're all guilty. They're all uh, under judgment. And so uh, then it goes on to say, using the same term, all men, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So this is talking about because of Jesus Christ, even so, by the righteousness of one, that's Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus, the death of, on the cross for our sins, uh, the free gift came for all men. So here we know that the judgment came upon all men and the righteousness came upon all men, the gift came upon all men. So they're trying to differentiate and say the same word, the same use of the word all men in one case means uh, uh, the whole world, but in the other case means that it's, uh, it's only the elect, only the saved. Now in Matthew 13, 44, it says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So in this uh, parable, uh, Jesus bought the f whole field with his blood. He bought the field, the whole field. He just didn't go hunting around in the, in the field and finding the, where the exact treasure was, the treasure is are the saints, those people, the elect, all of us who put our faith in Jesus. That's the treasure. And we're this little group of people in this big field, but he didn't just come and search out and buy them. He bought the whole field. He paid for the sins of the whole world. Uh, even though there's only a, 
a treasure hidden in a particular part of that field. Now, let's look at 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets among, uh, also among the people, even as there be, uh, shall be also teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Okay, so these are uh, false teachers. So these are, these are lost people. They're false prophets. They're false teachers uh, t teaching damnable heresies, and they are having swift destruction. These are lost people. And yet it says they are denying the Lord that bought them. So even these lost people, Jesus bought them. He paid for their sins. Finally, we'll look at 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, so again, there's a distinction here. He says, not for ours only, talking about the saved. Uh, he is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only. This is 1 John. He's talking to saved people. And he's saying Jesus is not just pay for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So for the saved people and the lost people, Jesus paid for everybody's sins. Now, uh, finally, we'll look at, or no, next we'll look at irresistible grace. Um, uh, now, it, it, anybody who sins knows that they can resist God. Uh, your conscience tells you one thing and you do another thing. The Holy Spirit's prompting you, you, you grieve the Spirit. You even you grieve it long enough, you resist the Spirit. Uh, everybody saved and lost sins and, and uh, we are able to resist the Spirit. Uh, so either um, we can resist God or we have to conclude that God makes us sin. We've already discussed that in previous videos. And that is one of the most shameful uh, lies of, of Calvinism, and that is that, that, that God is so sovereign that he controls everything we do, and therefore he's making us sin. Um, so let's look at seven, Acts 7.51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your Father did, so do ye. Right here it says these people... They always resist the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit. Uh, and so how, how is it possible for people to have uh, resist the Spirit and yet grace is irresistible? Uh, let's look at Leviticus 1.3. Uh, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. So here we have of his own voluntary will. Uh, that not only means a point we were talking about in the beginning, it's that man is not so totally depraved that he can't even uh, have a free will. Uh, here it says we, have, we can make a free will offering, uh, but it also under uh, irresistible grace, it says that we have a will. We have a free will, so we can resist and exercise our own free will. Uh, Matthew twenty three thirty seven, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You would not. It, it should have said, ye could not. Right? If they don't have a free will, and, and, if, and if they couldn't resist the grace, if grace is irresistible, then it would say, uh, ye could not because ye were not elect. But here it says, they would not. In other words, they were able to, but they would not. And then finally, on Tulip, tulip we have the P, stands for Perseverance of the Saints. Uh, when taught as eternal security, this, this would be true. However, that would be preservation 
uh, of the saints. Preservation by God, not perseverance by man. So perseverance is the Calvinist error that uh, works must, you know, your life must persevere with good works, your faith must persevere, and uh, otherwise you're not saved. But the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, works are not required to prove our salvation or to keep our salvation or to prove our salvation. It, but uh, we, we are preserved by God. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We can never lose our salvation, even if our good works don't persevere. Even if our faith does not persevere, we are still preserved. Um, now, uh, here's a, a here's a song sung by Calvinists. Uh, this documented in Dr. Lawrence Avance's book, The Other Side of Calvinism, and this is a Calvinist song they sing. We are the Lord's elected few, let all the rest be damned. There's room enough in hell for you, we won't have heaven crammed. Well, not only is Calvinism despicable, but people who actually understand Calvinism and embrace it, uh, to me, there's got to be something wrong with the person. When, once they understand what it is, and then they embrace it, and they could even sing a song like that, that, that is shameful. And it's certainly, uh, I, I don't see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in, uh, in a person that could uh, believe that. Um, but a, a Christian, a real Christian, instead of singing that song, they will sing the song, Whosoever will may come. That's real Christianity, whosoever will. Now, I want to make a couple of conclusions here. One thing I meant, should have mentioned earlier is that I talked about identifying with a man that being a cult and a, in a cult and having a cult leader and calling yourself a Calvinist. Uh, um, we should identify with Christ as a Christian, not not as a Lutheran, not as a Calvinist, not as an Arminian, uh, not as Apollos, not as Paul, not as Cephas. No, don't identify with any man or the, uh, man's teachings. Identify only with Christ, uh, and yet. If you identify with Calvin, and you are identifying yourself with the, the, the teachings and doctrines that I've explained in this, these videos, then um, to me, it's a, there's some kind of a psychological problem with a person that can embrace such an evil uh, belief system. But um, also, identifying with the man John Calvin is a problem because he was a horrible person. Uh, he tortured and murdered many people. He served like a tyrant over his city as an authoritarian. Uh, he's not an example that I, that I would ever want to be identified as a friend or follower of, of John Calvin. I have some videos on my playlist that you can see the documenting the life of John Calvin, and he was really a despicable, a horrible person. So that's something else that you might want to consider if you want to really be identified with his name. Now here's a, my basic theory about why we have Calvinism and uh, why it continues. Uh, first of all, it, I said earlier, it starts with Romans 9. I want to ask you to read, watch all the videos I have on this playlist explaining Romans 9 so you can see that Calvinism teaching on Romans 9 is very clearly wrong. Uh, but but if, you, if you take the Calvinist uh, interpretation of Romans 9, um, you, you're basically stuck with the idea that God hates some people and loves others. Jesus died for some people and not for others. And God predestined some people to hell, and they don't have a free will, and they can't even do anything about it. And, and that he sends them to hell just for his own pleasure. And other people, they're predestined to heaven, and there's no reason or rationale behind that. Uh, so... If you're going to take the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9, that's what you come up with. Then all the other things in the scriptures, like the verses I pointed to here today, um, and many more. I just scratched the surface. There's uh, every verse in the scripture that calls on someone to believe is, is uh, showing you that 
person has to has a free will choice. You know, why would be called ask someone to believe if they're not able to? Uh, so, what a Calvinist has to do if they accept Romans nine and from the Calvinist perspective is they have to take all the other scriptures and twist them. They have to try to force them to make them fit into the, the Calvinism interpretation of Romans nine. Uh, uh, and every every time the word all is used, they have to say it doesn't really mean all. It means it means all of a certain kind, all kinds, whosoever. Now it doesn't mean whosoever; it just means uh, those whosoever of the elect. Uh, the, when it says world, no, it doesn't mean the whole world. It just means all the different nations, uh, people from all different nations. All men doesn't mean all men; it means all kinds of men. So you see, they have to twist the words around and force them to mean things they don't really mean. Uh, if we didn't have Romans 9, if it was just removed for a moment, I, and I'm not proposing that it be removed, I'm proposing that it be understood correctly. But if, if a person wasn't aware of Romans 9 at all, we would naturally read all these other verses in a non-Calvinistic explanation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If a person was not already indoctrinated with Calvinism and didn't misunderstand Romans 9, they would logically conclude that when it says, for God so loved the world, that it's talking about God loves all the people in the world, everyone, not just a select few. So, um, I'll put this series of videos on my playlist, uh, Calvinism Debunked. I hope you watch this whole series. I hope you will watch all the other videos on the, uh, on the playlist. And, and I look forward to all your comments. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that if you are a Calvinist that you can see the error of your ways and, and, and depart from it. Uh, uh, if you're not a Calvinist, but you, you don't understand, you haven't understood these things before, I'm hopeful that this will make you understand how horrible Calvinism really is. And uh, I really think it's really a, a hateful, evil, false religion and a cult. Uh, I, I, I have friends who are um, of other belief systems, like Mormons and atheists and all, all, all kinds of people who don't believe in biblical Christianity and I could be their friend but I cannot have Christian fellowship with someone who does not believe in, believe in biblical Christianity uh, and if someone was a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon or uh, a member of any of these groups that we consider cults uh, I don't see any difference in Calvinism I think Calvinism is just as much a cult as those others and Calvinism is just as evil. It defames God. It makes God into an evil being. Uh, and it changes the message of salvation rather than faith alone in Christ alone to persevere to the end with good works. So thank you for watching. Uh, bless you all. And rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.